I want to take a, a few moments and share with you on the subject and the thought of Nehemiah and what are we building with our lives. Nehemiah is an amazing man of God who did a wonderful thing in his day and in his generation. The city of Jerusalem had been destroyed. The walls had been burnt and torn down. They were a mess, and the people were a disgrace among the other nations and cities. And Nehemiah does something in his generation that I think God wants to do in every generation. Nehemiah is used to help rebuild God's city and to restore God's people. Around the year 587 B.C., the Babylonians invaded Judah, and they destroyed everything. And with it, they destroyed the wall, the city, the temple, and they took the Israelites uh, captive. And over the course of the next 70 years, little by little, the Israelites that had been taken captive were, were uh, released and allowed to go back to Jerusalem. So for the next 70 years, people began to come back to the city, but they hadn't yet really returned back to God. And it's in this atmosphere, it's in this environment that we see Nehemiah and we begin to understand Nehemiah. Now, now Nehemiah was the cupbearer for the king of Persia. The king of Persia had come in and conquered the Babylonians who had conquered the Israelites. And so now Nehemiah, this man of God, is the cupbearer. The cupbearer was the person who would drink the king's drink and eat the king's food first to make sure there was no poison in it. And if anyone was trying to kill the king, Nehemiah would get it first. And that's not a great job. <laughs> you know, that's, that's a rough one. I mean, unless you have a good king. But if you got a bad king, it's like, oh, here we go again, you know. <laughs> Nehemiah has got this job, this position, and it is a lot of risk. But with it came great rewards. Nehemiah got to eat the finest food. He got to live in the palace with his family. Nehemiah had built trust and relationship with the king, and he was having communications. And Nehemiah, even though it was a risky job, Nehemiah was in a position of luxury, and he lived a life that a lot of people in that time did not get to live. Nehemiah had no official power, but he was a man of great influence, and we'll see this in our time today. Nehemiah, though, would eventually leave the luxury, leave the palace, and forfeit his comfort to do something, and, and, and what he would do is he would go back to Jerusalem to help rebuild a broken city, a broken people. I believe that God is looking for men and women today who are willing to do the same thing, step out of their comfort, step out of areas of luxury, to let go of things that sometimes we enjoy so much to make sure that we are building a good work for God, amen? And I wanna read in, Jer in Nehemiah uh, chapter two, verse 17, let's start here. Nehemiah is back in Jerusalem. He's rallied the people together, and he's about to do this great work. And I want to read, starting in verse 17, Nehemiah said this. Then I said to them, you see the trouble that we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be a disgrace. And I also told them about the gracious hand of God upon me and what the king had said to me. And they replied, let us start rebuilding. And so they began this good work. Vision always excites people to start working. Nehemiah had a vision and he's talking to the people and he begins to say, look, we can do this. And the people said, let's start rebuilding. Let's rebuild and let's do a good work. I like how the Bible says good work. It's not just a work, but it was a good work. See, the question I think today is not, are you building something? We're all building something with our lives. We're all doing something. The question today is, are we building something good? Are we doing a good work? Are we building something that's going to impact the kingdom of God and last and impact e eternity? Are we building something good with our lives? I know a lot of people today, I have friends who are married but they're not building good marriages. I, ha I know people that who, you know, they have careers, but they're not building a good future. You know, it's, it's one thing to build a life. It's a whole other thing to build a good life. And I think God wants all of us not to just live and to build and to do stuff. I think he wants us to build something good. I think he's looking at this church and saying, I want you to build something great in San Jose, to build something great in this neighborhood. I, I believe God wants us to do something good with our lives. See, so many times people will spend years, 60, 70 years 
building a life, building stuff, only to find out at the very end what they built wasn't good. I remember when I heard one successful businessman who had made a lot of money in his life, he had all the fame, all the money, all the fortune, he said this. He said, I have sacrificed years of my life. I've missed out on holidays with my family. I have broken promises to my kids. I have lost many friends along the way. I have fought to climb up the ladder of success only to find out when I got to the top, the ladder was leaning on the wrong building. You know, it's amazing how much time we can spend chasing after stuff that's not good. We're building something, we're working for something, and then we realize, you know what, is this good? Is this what God wants? I, when I was younger, I used to love building stuff. And I'd build car models, you know, and I would glue the airplanes together. I would build skateboards. I used to love building ramps. We'd take our skateboards and we'd go off these ramps and there's nails sticking out and screws sticking. And this, you know, we just would build stuff. And one day, my friend Adam and I, we got this idea to build a tree house. It's gonna be the best tree house on the block, but it wasn't just gonna be any tree house. It was gonna have a rope swing so that we could jump off the tree house and swing. And man, we just had this thing. It, you know, nothing better than two 10 year old boys with an idea to construct a tree house that we're going to jump off of. Um, and so we got all inspired. We grabbed our hammers and nails. We grabbed any piece of wood we could find. We ripped wood off of our, our, my dad's fence. We were grabbing wood from the neighbor's fence. We just we grabbed that and we found wood in the street. We just started pounding away and built. We built. An hour later, we had the best tree house you could have imagined. It was amazing. Rope swing, everything. But now it was the moment of truth to test it out. So we climb up on this thing and we're, you know, jumping on it. Okay, it looks good. And I looked at my friend and I said, okay, now jump off on the swing. Yeah, I wasn't going first, you know. And so he, he was like, yeah, yeah, let's do it. So my friend Adam, we, we built this thing. He jumps off and, he's sw- and he just takes off flying. He's swinging, the wind's blowing. He's just, ah, he's just having a good time. You know, he is going for it. And right when he got to the bottom where the swing comes up, I heard a and I looked and all of a sudden half the tree house broke, fell off, and my friend Adam went flying with the rope and half the tree house into the street just and just slid everywhere. I sat there and I realized something in this moment of my life. We had built something. We just didn't build something good. I sat there and thought, well, we really put a lot of work into that, but it just wasn't that good. It was quick, it was cheap, it was easy. And you know, it was dangerous. My friend could have been hit by a car. He could have really been injured. And, and I was thinking about this today as I was praying. You know, sometimes it's easier, it's cheaper, it's quicker to build our lives, you know, different than the way God wants. Sometimes it seems easier to build it the way we want instead of the way God wants. But how I many you know when you build your life on things that are cheaper and easier and we don't build them according to God's word, it might seem easier, but it's dangerous. It's dangerous to build your life on anything but the word of God and what God has. And so it, it, it's, it's the question today is what are we building? There are some men in the Bible, like Nehemiah, they begin to build a city. Like Nehemiah, they said, let's get together. Let's rally the people. Let's build something great. And I want you to see this story. I want you, if you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. If you're using a church Bible, it's on page 7. I'm going to read out of the church Bible right here. They're located in the pews right in front of you if you don't have your Bible. Genesis chapter 11, I want you to see this account of some men who got together and they tried to build something, but what they were building was not of God. It says in Genesis chapter 11, verse one, it says, now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As men moved eastward, they found in a plain in Shinar and they settled there. And then they said to each other, come let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Verse four, they said, come let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches up to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the men were building. And the Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Verse seven, come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. And so the Lord scattered them from all over the earth and they stopped building the city. 
And that is why it is called Babel, because the Lord confused the language of the whole world, and from there they were scattered all throughout the earth. Isn't this amazing? It's an interesting story to me, every time I read it, that they begin to build something, and God comes down to see it, and he begins to take notice what they're doing. And you see what they're doing in the words that they use. They said, let us build a city, let us build a tower that goes into the heavens. Let us sit at the same level as God. Let us elevate ourselves so that we will be in the heavens like God. They said, let us make a name for ourselves. See, Nehemiah is trying to build something for God. The men in, in, in Babylon here in the Tower of Babel, they are trying to build something for themselves. And it's, they said, we won't be scattered. We don't need to, the Lord to protect us. We don't need the help of God. We will do this ourselves. We will make a name for ourselves. Be careful when you begin to build things in your life and you know that deep down it is building on pride and arrogance and for your own glory and not God's. Because see, what happens is God comes down and he says, I've got to check this out. I believe it's the nature of God to come down and disrupt anything in our lives that we are building that doesn't please the Lord. God says, I, I know you're building this, but you know what? You're not building a good thing here. You're building something and I've got to come down and I've got to try to stop this because what you're building is not good. When, when you begin to build things in your life that are not good, it's the love of God that says, hold on, hold on. This isn't good what you're doing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cause conflict in your life here. God says, I love you, and I'm going to make it difficult for you to keep disobeying me. I love you, and so I'm going to come down and make it difficult for you to keep going this way because what you're building is not of God, and it's not good. See, a good work will honor God. A bad work will honor yourself. They said, we'll make a name for ourselves. A good work will unite people. Nehemiah, the people got rallied up, but a bad work will confuse the people. By the end of this story, they were all confused. God is not the author of confusion. When you're building something in your life and there's confusion and there's disorder, you gotta ask yourself, what am I building? A good work will restore brokenness. A bad work will create more damage. A good work will be blessed by God, but a bad work in our lives will be opposed by God. When we begin to build pride, when we build arrogance, when we build sin, when we build habits that produce bondage, whatever it is that we're building, if it's not a good work, God says, I love you enough to come down and, and say, this isn't good. We've got to stop this. Nehemiah wasn't building something for himself. Nehemiah was building something for God. So how do we take what Nehemiah did and apply it to our lives. What are some things that we can, we can learn from his life today? That's what I love about the scriptures and reading the stories of the men and women of God. We can apply it to our lives and we can learn some lessons today. And the first thing I want you to see if you're taking notes today is this. Number one, Nehemiah recognized the problem. He recognized there's a problem. The first thing we, we hear him, he says, you see the trouble we're in. You see it. It was obvious. There was a huge problem. The walls were destroyed. There was no protection. They had been the laughing stock uh, for years. They were a mess. And Nehemiah says, you see it. You see the problem. I believe a lot of times the first thing that happens in our life before we start building something with, with, with our lives for God is that there's a, we recognize there's a problem. How many remember when you got saved and you gave your life to the Lord? There was, most of us at some point we said, there's a problem here. Things aren't right with God. And when we recognize the problem, it begins to position us to build something for God. Nehemiah saw there's a problem. Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 2, I want, I want to read this verse to you. It says, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. And they said to me, those who survived the exile, they're back in the province, they are in great trouble, and they are a disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. And when I heard these things, I sat down and wept, for some time, I mourned and I fasted and I prayed before the God of heaven. See, what happens here is up to this point, Nehemiah has no idea what's going on with the city. But he gets a revelation. He gets the information. He hears about the problem. And all of a sudden, he is burdened for this city. 
That's what a revelation will do. A revelation will bring burden in your life. I, I can't tell you how many times where, where all of a sudden I see somebody or I hear something that's happening and it breaks my heart and I begin to cry out to God. That's what it does. A burden will cause you to seek God. Nehemiah gets a revelation. He recognizes there's a huge problem. He recognizes there's something wrong with the city and a burden begins to grow and he begins to seek God. Let me ask you this question today. When you see the broken places in our world, when you come across the broken people at work, when you see the things that aren't right and you begin to recognize the problems in, in the world that you live in, in the world that I live in, when you see and you begin to recognize the problem, is there a burden inside of you that begins to grow? Does it cause you to seek God? You know, I, I just, I think about our city. It doesn't take much to realize there's some things that are wrong. You know, you watch the news. It doesn't take much to realize in our generation there's some things that are broken. There's some things that the enemy has destroyed. And I believe God is just looking for people who are willing to say, you know what, I see it. I recognize it. What can we do? Nehemiah saw and he recognized the problem. When we see the lost, when we see the hurting, do we seek God? Is there a burden inside of us that begins to grow? Matthew 14, 14, look at this verse with me. When Jesus landed and he saw, he saw the large crowd, he had compassion on them and he healed their sick. See, there's a compassion. There, there is a, a burden that comes when you begin to see the sick and you begin to see the hurting and you see the broken. When you look at the prisons and you see the hurting, I drove the other day by the juvenile hall here in San Jose. I've never driven, I didn't know it was there and I drove by and I saw it and it just broke my heart thinking of all the young people. When we walk out on the college campuses and we see the broken and I know that there are people and how they're living and the things that are going on, oh, it just begins to burn. There's something wrong. Jesus saw the hurt, he saw the sickness, and he had compassion, and he began to do something about it. See, that's what happens when you recognize the problem. It begins to move you into action. Jesus began to heal, and he began to build something in the lives of those around him when he saw the need. Number two, we see this in Nehemiah as he begins to take ownership. It's one thing to see a problem. It's a whole other thing to say, I will do something about it. I've been guilty of this, you know, where you go, I will pray. <laughs> oh, I'll pray that God will do something through someone else. Lord, please send somebody to do something about that. There, there's a, it's easy to recognize the problem. It's a whole other issue to take ownership. Nehemiah said, let us rebuild. Let us do something. We can't pass this on to the next generation. We can't just say somebody else will do something for God. We have to do it. When you take ownership of the plans that God has for you, there is a passion of responsibility deep within. Something inside says, I've got to do this. Something inside says, I've got to do this. And Nehemiah said, let us rebuild. Let's not wait another 70 years. Let's not pray for somebody else. Let us rebuild. You know how easy it would have been for Nehemiah for him to just say, you know what, man, that's too bad. The city's still in ruin. Man, you know what, I'm just going to pray that God would send somebody else. You know what, this just isn't my problem. I'm here, I'm serving the king, and I've got to stay here. There's no way the king will let me go. And, you know, I've got a good thing going here. I just can't get involved right now. It really doesn't work out. See, when you take ownership of the things that God wants you to build in your life, it's going to push you out of your comfort zone. It's going to push you out of your palace and your luxuries and out to where the people are. At some point, you're gonna have to get down and get your hands dirty and start grabbing bricks and saying, I see this problem. I will build something great for God because I don't wanna just spend my life building. I wanna spend my life building something good for God. He takes ownership. Let me read this verse in Ezekiel 22. Ezekiel 22, 30. I think it's the cry of God today for us as a church. Ezekiel 22, verse 30, I looked for someone who might rebuild the wall of righteousness that guards the land. I searched for someone to stand in the gap in the wall so that I wouldn't have to destroy the land, but I found no one. 
can you see God today? It's like he's in heaven looking, going, who's going to do this? Who will stand in the gap? Who will build the wall? Who will help build the broken places of San Jose? Who will go to the hurting and the lost? Who, who will stand up like Nehemiah and say, we've got to do something? Who will take ownership of the vision for this generation? Bethel Church, we have a great vision. It is to reach and to rebuild and to help the families right here in this neighborhood. I think that is an amazing vision, but it's only going to work. We will only be able to build something if we as a church and as a family say, we will take ownership of this. We will do something for God. After Nehemiah takes ownership, we see that he encourages the people. You can't spend too much time looking at the problem, because let me know if you spend all your time looking at the problem, pretty soon it's going to burden you down. Look how much work there is. Look at what we've got to do. Man, look at how messed up this world is. How do we begin to change it? How do we? See, Nehemiah does something so great. He begins by talking about the problem, but he ends by focusing on God. He says, the gracious hand of God is upon me. And he talks about the favor that he had with the king so that he could go. He encourages the people. The word encourage means to put in courage. He's putting in courage. At some point, we've got to be able to get our eyes off the problem and get our eyes back on God and encourage others. We need to see the problem, but we must always focus on the solution. And the answer to any problem in any generation is still the same today as it was a thousand years ago. The answer for the broken things of our city and our world is still Jesus Christ. Amen? He is the answer. And so he encourages them. I want to encourage us today that when we do something great for God and we begin to build for God, he says, I will help you and I will build with you. And it's going to be amazing what you can do when you stand and do something for me. Nehemiah encourages others. And that is one of the first things that we are going to do, need to do if we're going to build something. We're going to need to encourage others. Whatever God's called you to do, I promise you can't do it on your own. You're going to need others. But there are times in our lives, how many know there are times when it's not about encouraging others. We need to encourage ourselves too. David said this in 1 Samuel 30, uh, verse 6. I want to read this. It says, And David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because the soul of the people was grieved for every man, of, for his son, and for his daughter. All the families had been kidnapped and taken away. And it says that David encouraged himself in the Lord. If we're going to build things for God, if we're going to build a marriage, a ministry, a life, if we're going to build something great for God, there are going to be times that we'll need to encourage others, and there are going to be times we're going to need to encourage ourselves. Nehemiah didn't just encourage people. He didn't just start a great work. Number four is this. Is it says Nehemiah finished what he started. How I many know the important thing in life is not how we start, how we finish? It's not how we start. It's how we finish it's easy to start something. It's a whole other thing to finish it. It's easy to start a marriage. It is hard, and it takes work to build and to finish and to, and to live your life in, in a successful marriage, to raise a godly family. It's easy to start a plan or a vision for God, but it takes work and dedication to finish that and to build something great for God. It's easy to start a fight. I could walk up to any dude on the street and say, your mom is so ugly that, you, you know, I could start a fight. <laughs> you know, it's a whole other thing to finish the fight. And we're in a fight. Paul said, I have fought the good fight of faith. It's one thing to start this fight, but it's a whole other thing to finish. We're not just starting a race. We're finishing a race. We're not just starting a good work for God. We want to build something great in our day and in our generation. Mark chapter 13, verse 13, it says, but the one who endures to the end shall be saved. There's no reward for those who quit. There's no reward for those who quit. Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 15, as we get ready to close our time, it says this. So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elul in 52 days, 52 days, and they had finished the wall Verse 16, when all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of God. Isn't that powerful? That what you're building in your life will reveal God to those around you. 
When people look at the marriage you're building, it should reveal God. When people look at the, the ministry that you're building, it should reveal God. When people look at your family and your homes, when people look at your businesses, whatever it is that we're building, if we're building a good work and we're building for God, it should reveal who Jesus is to those around us. That they look and they go, wow, look at what God is doing in their life. You know that's God because there's no way they could have done that without God. That's what happens when we build for God. See, Jesus is the foundation of what we build. Jesus is the foundation for our lives. We know that. But what we build with our lives and how we build for God, one day, it's all going to be judged. And I want to give you one last verse, 1 Corinthians 3. Before we change the order of this service, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 12. I want, I want you to see this with me. I think it's so important to remember that what we're building, one day we're going to stand before God, and what we build is going to be laid out, and it's going to be judged. Starting in verse 12, anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, straw, but on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value to it. If the work survives, the builder will receive a reward, but if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like somebody barely escaping through the walls of flames. Isn't that amazing? The mental picture of that. We're gonna stand before God and say, here, here's what I built. Here's what I did for you, God. Here, here's how I spent my life. Here's how I spent my time. Here's, here's the things that I attempted to do. And God's going to say, okay, let's go and let's see what was built as a good work and what was built as a selfish work or for your glory instead of mine. And it's all going to get, I, I tell you, I just want to live my life in a way that when we're done here, when I, however long I live, if it's 80 years, 90 years, 100 years, I want to live in a way that when God looks at my life, he says, good job, you built something good for me. I don't know what it is that God's called you to build in your life, but whatever it is, he's called you to build something great for him. He's called you to build something good. What are you building? How are you building it? Like Nehemiah, when you see the broken things, when there are stuff in your life that is burdening you and you know God has called you to do something, will you take ownership? Will you get your hands dirty? Will you rally in this day and age and say, okay, God, let's go. Let's go build something great for your glory. Would you let me pray for you today?